Coming up on today's show. You don't have to have a strong faith in order to be sporting, but it would be odd to say that you are faith-centered and not be sporting. Peace be with you. This is Catholic Sports Radio, located at the intersection of your faith life and sports life, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and lots and lots of other platforms. I am Bruce Wozniak, talking with Catholic guests who are current or former athletes, coaches, referees, umpires, clergy, administrators, and more from the pro, amateur, and scholastic ranks about the intersection of their faith life and their sports life. The show website is catholicsportsradio.net or .com. They will both get you to the same place. Be sure that you have signed up there for free for the Catholic Sports Radio e-newsletter that gets sent out each Monday. That's it, really, just once a week, I promise. If you did not hear last week's episode, I mentioned that Catholic Sports Radio is in shouting distance of 1,000 followers on X, Twitter, and even closer to 600 followers on Instagram, So while you are on the website signing up for the newsletter, look at the top of any page on the site and you will see social media links, logos for this show, meaning Facebook, X, Instagram, and YouTube, so that you can engage with me and the show that way and help hit those two specific plateaus that I just mentioned. The Catholic Sports Radio community is the Facebook group consisting of listeners of this show and some past guests. That is free to join, and you can also find a link for that, too, on catholicsportsradio.net. I love hearing from listeners, truly. And so social media, as well as the website, all give you the opportunity to contact me, as does traditional email, which you can do through bruce at catholicsportsradio.net. Now on to my ministry moment for this episode. I really thought that bigger, stronger, faster was some sort of official tagline, some sort of motto for some team or organization or movement or something, so much so that I looked up online so that I could have my memory jogged. And while I was not able to put my finger on what I was hoping to be led to, I saw that there is a film, a song, and a book that all have that title. It's because so much emphasis is put on athletes who are training and needing to get bigger, stronger, and faster, right? Isn't that something that a lot of NFL rookies likely had as an off-season target now that training camps are starting up? What about us in our faith life, though? Are we taking strides to grow our spiritual muscle? What steps do we each take so that we can grow in Christianity? Never mind trying to show off our sculpted bodies to people who see us. Instead, are we putting in reps at home so as to reflect more the presence of God in our lives? In the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 says, quote, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we have for you. I am continually grateful to Christian Healthcare Ministries for their decision to support Catholic Sports Radio, as you have been hearing throughout this month, Christian Healthcare Ministries is a faith based alternative to traditional health insurance. For over 40 years, CHM has provided a biblical framework that allows Christians to take care of each other's medical bills. Learn more at chministries.org slash Catholic radio. Moving on now with this week's episode, my guest is the head coach for women's soccer at Belmont Abbey College, a Catholic college in North Carolina. Having started there in 2011, he has a 633 winning percentage and has earned two conference regular season championships, two conference tournament championships, and competed in three NCAA postseason tournaments. Prior to Belmont Abbey, he also held coaching jobs at Nebraska Wesleyan University and Truman State University, and as an assistant coach at the United States Air Force Academy. He had played college soccer at the United States Air Force Academy. After graduation, he competed for the active duty USAF soccer team in 1984 and 1985, and was selected to the United States Armed Forces National Team in 1984. 
He served as faith-based coaches community chair for United Soccer Coaches from 2017 to 2022 and is now on the board of directors. He has even completed several marathons, including the Boston Marathon. Welcome to Catholic Sports Radio, Mike Lynch. Thank you, Bruce. A uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to this. Let's start off by having you tell us first where you were born and raised and what the family size was. I was born in Bay, South Carolina, which is just uh, to the west of Myrtle Beach. And uh, my dad was military, so we moved all over uh, the country. I was the youngest of four. I have uh, two older brothers and an older sister. I was the baby of the family. Ah, okay. This was a Catholic household that you grew up in, yes? T- tell us about your and your family's faith life when you were a young boy. Yes, I was a cradle Catholic. And, uh, you know, I would say that probably the biggest memory I have growing up is just uh, our Sunday Mass ritual. I can't remember us ever missing Mass, which is Mm. good. And that kind of built in me that this is just what you do, and something I really appreciated uh, as I got older. You must have seen your share of churches as a military brat and all the moving that it sounds like your family did. Yeah, it's interesting. We were in eight different locations in my first 18 years. Mm. It's a little bit two years we were in a new spot. And certainly uh, every military base We'll have, uh, you know, a Catholic church, we'll have a Protestant church, you know, to be able to, and sometimes even just a, like a synagogue and those kinds of things, to be able to uh, support their service members. And so that was always nice. The other thing that was really great growing up was they always had excellent youth sports. If so if you lived on base, there was always a, a great youth sports environment. And I found that to be uh, really helpful for me as we kept moving around. Yeah, as much as your resume is littered with soccer entries in the lead-up to today, you sent me something saying that you actually started out as a multi-sport athlete before finally settling in with soccer. Walk us through all that. Which sports did you play, and was there someone, by the way, who really inspired you to participate in sports, or was it just self-initiated? Uh, our family was very active. My dad uh, did a lot of sports, a lot of even like things like hunting and fishing, those just being outdoors. We were just a very outdoor-oriented family. And then I was the youngest, and so I was following in the footsteps of my older siblings, and they were all into sports. So I don't know, again, my parents, when they were you know, young and getting into sports, they were taking the lead on that. But all I was doing was just following my older siblings, and I just couldn't wait to be able to finally put on a uniform. Back then, remember, it's like I don't think you could participate in an organized sports team until you were in second grade. And so as when my uh, – siblings were in uniforms and getting to play little league ball and that kind of stuff. I was, you know, in my jeans and a t-shirt that when I look back at family photos with my mitt and my baseball, you know, just dying to be able to finally be on a sports team. But I uh, played football, basketball, baseball, swim team. Mm. You know, if it was whatever season it was, we did it. And uh, I just loved them all. And looking back on it, I think, I don't know if that's where the seeds were planted as far as being a coach, but I was always intrigued on just how each game was played, the simple tactics that you learn as a youngster in the sports because it's still a form of competitive play. And so you're playing, but there's a purpose to it. We're trying to put the ball in the net, or, you know, in the state of soccer example, more than they're putting in ours. And so I just was always intrigued by that. And especially as I got older, I really, really hooked onto it. But I was a sports junkie. And I mentioned to you about how important that was as a military brat. You know, when you're moving around the country and you're having to make new friends, sometimes you lived on base, sometimes they lived in what they called the economy, which means you lived off base. But if you lived on base, everybody was in the same situation you were when you arrived in a new location. And so it was relatively easy to make friends. But you're coming into a school year halfway through, so there was a lot of disruptions. But sports was always the piece that uh, allowed me to hit the ground running. Because like sometimes you go into a classroom, and then but you had a basketball team, and now those became some of your best friends. Yeah. And so to me, sports as a military brat was just essential to be able to you know have some sanity to a kind of a crazy lifestyle. Yeah, I like it. I like it. In 1978, you attended a soccer camp that would end up being significant to you for both faith and sports reasons. Explain to the audience what I'm referring to. The summer of 78, I attended the Fellowship of Christian Athletes soccer camp in Dayton, Ohio. 
And I, I chose the camp, as you mentioned, I made the transition from football, basketball, and baseball in junior high, played some basketball until I was a sophomore in high school, and then I, it was interfering with my indoor soccer. So I really became a full-time soccer junkie when I was in high school. And so I selected this camp because they had excellent coaches there. I had no idea mm. that it was a faith-centered, faith-based camp. Uh. I just I went there because I saw the staff, and I go, wow, this is a place that I think I can really <laughs> learn from. You know, and I get there, and we're starting with a you know a huddle, a faith huddle. I don't know if you're familiar with FCA camps, but they always start with a devotional. And of course, I'm you know grew up in the Catholic Church, and so I, this isn't something that we do all the time in a sporting event. But I'm like perfect. I'm not against it, and so I was very open to it. I mean, it's kind of a great way to start the session because not only would we talk about a scripture verse, but we would also then relate that to what does that mean to you as a person, you as an athlete, those kinds of things. Mm. And I had never made that connection before Mm. that. It was a week-long camp. It was a great camp. And from that point forward, I really, really found that my faith could be a great place to get my mind in the right spot for Mm. my athletics and everything, of course, Mm -hmm. but certainly in my athletics. And I had a deep interest in peak performance and sports psychology. In fact, it was a term paper that I did in my junior high class. Mm. And so it was the first time you had to, you know, do deep research, write a whole bunch of pages, have a bibliography, those kinds of things. But when I did that paper, I was really fascinated with just how powerful the mind is and how your best and worst performances in any period of time is going to be from the neck up. It's really mm. not going to be, you know, you may make small gains in your speed, small gains in your endurance, you know, a little bit of gains in your technique, maybe some tactical nuances, but really it's your confidence, it's your uh, resolve, it's your persistence, it's your hope. You know, if there's no hope, there's no action. And so the mind is so powerful. And so now we know that obviously our mind is a huge part of our faith. It, it is our faith. <laughs> it's, our, it's our connection. This is where we're praying to God. And not asking for good performances, but just asking to be able to be present, to be present to what God has available for us. And it allowed me to start playing with less stress. I mean, mm, no longer was wow. I you know, playing for the identity or playing for the outcome. I was just playing to hopefully glorify God, hopefully do it in a way that, you know, help my teammates, those kinds of things. And it really, really made a difference to me. I used my FCA worksheets because you know, that was the other thing I thought that was kind of cool was we actually took notes during the devotional. Mm. <laughs> so the notes that I took during that devotional, I used the rest of my high school career as well as into my college career. And mm. I still have those notes today. Oh, my gosh. They were just so powerful to me. Wow. Wow. And folks, you heard Mike referencing junior high And as I mentioned in the intro, Mike played college soccer at the United States Air Force Academy, in fact, earning all league and all region accolades and serving as team captain his senior year. Mike, is it a foregone conclusion that when someone attends the Air Force Academy, the level of discipline there leaves no room for straying off towards whatever Satan might be trying to tempt someone with? Or is it a case of, hey, you're still college age and (laughs) need to really stay focused on your studies and, in my case, soccer, or, yeah, you can still get into trouble. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, everybody's 18 to 22 years old, and so, you know, with that comes sometimes knuckleheadness. But that's, you know, you're at a service academy, so if you didn't think it was going to be a disciplined environment, then somebody put one by you, I guess. Mm. And so that uh, appealed to me. You know, my dad was military, so I kind of knew, and he was a West Point grad, so... I was a little bit familiar with the service academy, but I tell you, um, other than I was comfortable with the lifestyle, I knew that if I was going to go and have a job, my dad always loved his work. And then I also knew that the people that used to come over to our houses, the parents of my friends, were just really, really good people, sharp and smart and loving and kind, supportive, that kind of stuff. So I knew that if this was a career field that I would eventually go into, that would be great. Although I knew it's not, you know, having to make a career decision at that point, but at least that's what you're open to. And I tell you again, it was the soccer piece that really got me to go. When I was first contacted and being recruited, I was not planning on considering a service academy. Mm -hmm. I had ideas and places that I wanted to go play and things I wanted to do. And I really just kept that door open. And I thank God for that because 
if I had closed that door early in the recruiting process, maybe I would never have been recruited. Mm. But uh, I kept the door open and said, well, I'm just going to, you know, kind of see where this goes. And my oldest brother, who I have deep respect for, he's such a hard worker. He was always, he always took me everywhere. And maybe that was my mom saying, hey, you know, you can't go somewhere unless you take your little brother with you. (laughs) But he never made me feel like I was a burden. And yet he always included me in whatever we were playing, whether it was dodgeball or we were playing, you know, pickup basketball. He always would say, my little brother's got to play too. So I just adored my brother growing up. And so uh, as I go through high school and I'm getting now near to my college decision, my oldest brother's five years older than me. You know, he was kind of uh, having a hard time finding a job. I mean, this is the mid-1970s. The economy was tough, and he thought he wanted to be a, a doctor. And so, and his grades were good, but they weren't quite doctor good. And so uh, um, now he's trying to figure out, you know, what is he going to do? And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, if Tim is having a hard time finding a job, what am I going to do? Mm. <laughs> because, you know, I used to think, okay, maybe I'm disciplined, but nothing like Tim. I mean, Tim was like, a, <laughs> he was amazing. So I just thought, oh, well, the academy, you can graduate with a job. That's perfect. If you graduate, you're on active duty. And, but it was really the soccer, the soccer piece. Once I got to meet Coach Sagastume and I understood just what he represented, what he could do for me as far as developing me as a player and the kind of program they had, that's what really got me to go. And that's what sustained me while I was there because the academics were so hard. Mm. It was the soccer that kept my tank full and uh, kept me motivated. Oh, this is great testimony, folks, from what Mike has shared about being at the FCA camp and now what you're hearing about his college years. As I was preparing for this interview, doing my usual research along with what the guest sends, which in Mike's case included a photo that shows a Bible verse over the top of the lockers in Belmont Abbey's locker room. Plus, when he talks about win, it's not the victory on the playing field. It's an acronym that he will tell us the meaning of, not to mention which Bible verse that I'm referring to. Meanwhile, there is plenty of other work behind the scenes keeping me busy with Catholic Sports Radio, including, yuck, the part that I don't like, which is having to pay all the bills that come with operating this ministry both on and off the air. In fact, as much as I talk about the weekly e-newsletter, there were some issues I was having with it, and the email marketing expert that I had been using has closed up her business. So I had to put time in trying to find someone else. Thankfully, I did. But she, of course, has sent me a bill for the work that she did. So the expenses feel like they just keep adding up. That is tough for me when you consider that not only is this neither my full nor my part-time job, but that I don't get any income from doing this show. As a result, I have to try to find some way out of my own pocket to try to cover all the expenses that you hear me detail over numerous episodes of this show. All this is to say that I ask you to prayerfully consider this ministry as part of your tithing. If this show is helping you in your faith life, if you believe in the mix of faith and sports, if you like what I'm doing with the Catholic Sports Radio ministry, and you see value in all that I put into this and would like to support these ongoing efforts, I would be most grateful for your making a financial gift. There is a blue Donate to CSR button on the homepage of catholicsportsradio.net or .com. They will both get you to the same place. As some listeners and guests who have done it would attest, that is fast, easy, and secure. There is no list of amounts to have to choose from. You simply type in whatever amount you're comfortable giving. And by the way, this will allow you to use a credit card, debit card, or even PayPal. Alternatively, as some folks have opted to do, you can get in touch with me about sending a check through the mail. Contact me through the website or through social media, Or just email me via bruce at catholicsportsradio.net and I will email you back with the details on sending something that way. Regardless of which method you use, the blue Donate to CSR button on the website or sending me a check. With your permission, I will happily say your name on the air as a public thanks or as some people have instructed me to do, you can ask to remain anonymous. I'm grateful for your considering Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing as I continue working to move more people closer to Christ through the mix of faith and sports. To sort of carry over a bit from what we were hearing before the break, this is really different. My Catholic Sports Radio ministry, of course, is based on the mix of faith and sports. I want this week's guest to tell us now about mixing military and sports. 
Mike followed his father's footsteps into the Air Force, marking his family's sixth straight generation of military service dating back to the U.S. Civil War. Mike, it seems logical, but in your own words, how were you able to mix the lessons of being in the Air Force with coaching soccer? Boy, I tell you, there's so many things that uh, overlap and support each other. And I, you know, sometimes people have this view of, of what the military is all about, but the military is about taking care of your people. Mm. It's about uh, making sure they're fed, making sure your troops have a bed, make sure that, you know, things are, you know, otherwise, I mean, the unit's just not going to be successful. So the leadership lessons that are required in a military environment are the same as you would find in a competitive sports environment or in a company environment. And so I felt like they were a great match for my interests and for my development and those kinds of things. And so I've always felt that they were very similar. I've been a big reader of history, and I really love military history. And then I really love also leadership and management development. And it seems like it's the same theme in all those books, Mm -hmm. whether it's an autobiography of a leader or it's about a military battle. Let's go back to time you spent in Omaha, where you say your faith was really deepened. Explain to the audience how that was, as well as what you were doing in Omaha. So in my professional career, I was in the active duty Air Force, and then I got out of the Air Force and became a college soccer coach. And then that's when uh, Chrisanne and I were married, and that's when Ryan was born, you know. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, I decided to jump out of uh, coaching and go into healthcare, pharmaceutical sales. So I did that, and then I did that for the next 14 years. Mm. And I was good at it, and they were promoting me, and you get the golden handcuffs on. It was actually uh, just draining the life right out of me. Mm. And for a lot of people, they love the work, and yet for me, I just wanted to be on the field. (laughs) I wanted to get back into coaching so bad. And so I had season tickets to Creighton, you know, and watching Creighton play and everything. I was just like, I just, I always want to be on the sidelines. And so Omaha is my last job at Pfizer when I was working in pharmaceuticals. And Mm. I managed a sales team over three states. And so that was supposed to be my coaching fix. That was the plan. And then meanwhile, I could coach my kid, which again, if I was a college coach, may have been more difficult to do just with the time and everything. And so it was a real blessing. And that time in Omaha, the time I had with Pfizer, I look at it kind of a dichotomy. I mean, it was 14 years, and I feel like uh, from a soccer coaching point of view, those years were stolen from me. And yet from our family and for my own development and things, it was such a blessing. I can't imagine where I would be today if I hadn't had that time. It was just really, really good as well. And so, But my time in Omaha is also so when I started coaching my kids. And uh, it was just super fun. And I'm coming out of Mass at St. Vincent de Paul. We had just the most fantastic parish in Omaha at St. Vincent de Paul. And like most of the parishes in Omaha, they all have an elementary school, and uh, usually K through 8. And so before, because there's a strong Catholic high school uh, environment in uh, in Omaha as well, with many schools to choose from. But everybody, you go to your parish school, and then that's where you do your sports, and that's where, you know, you have your whole community. It was so excellent. And I, so we're coming out of Mass, and uh, Mike Eggleseeder, he comes up to me and says, uh, Mike, I hear you're a soccer coach. And I said, yeah, um, I love the game. And he goes, well, I've got your team for you. So this was my middle son, Kevin. And so he was, I want to say they were probably six or seven. Uh, they were kindergarten, first grade, that kind of age group. And uh, he goes, I've got all these kids. And, uh, you know, they have the Catholic Youth Soccer League, and you can put your team together. And so sure enough, it was just a really, really great bunch of kids. They were hand-picked super athletes, even at that time, I will mm. say that. But uh, they were great. I mean, they just had so much energy, and uh, they really, you know, latched on to the game. And, of course, at that age, especially in, in Catholic youth sports, everybody's playing everything. So it was that good multi-sport environment. The kids just went from this is their soccer team to their basketball team to their baseball team, you know, that kind of stuff. So when I had them with soccer, and then we eventually – got on the local travel club as they got older and that kind of stuff is when I really started to say, you know what, I'm going to incorporate 
my faith life into my sports. Mm. And so that's what I really started to focus my team on. I knew that if I, you know, you train them up in the way they should go and when they're, when they're old, they won't depart from it. So, you know, as far as the joy for the game, the love for the game, the love for being a great teammate, the love for how their faith can support them in that pursuit wow. and that kind of stuff. And so that's where I really started to do that. At the same time, I was in sales and so I was managing salespeople. So I'm in the car all the time. The rule I would usually listen to books on the way out to work. And then I would uh, listen to music kind of on the way back. Mm -hmm. But I fell in love with Christian music. Mm. And so all of a sudden I discovered K Love, you know, that, and, yeah, and I could pick up. I knew if I was, it was this frequency. And, you know, like when I'd get out in this town, it was this frequency I'd get in that town. And so I always had a radio station that was just, building me up and encouraging me and, you know, anytime you listen to Christian music. And so that was hitting me at the same time. I also, cause I was coaching again, more actively coaching. I re-engaged with the coach association. So, you know, I'd start coach. I went to the convention. They have an annual convention where you get to see all the latest and greatest tactics and stuff like that. So it's just a super fun experience. So I re-engaged with that. And while I was there at the exhibit hall, I came across the FCA booth. And uh, I introduced myself and just told them what a strong influence their organization had mm. on me when I was a young player. Yeah. And, uh, you know, struck up uh, a new friendship and really started to get me thinking about sport and faith again. Wow. And so those two things were happening as I was also, you know, just dying to get back in the game. Mm. <laughs> and Tremendous. So, and every time a position would come open, my wife would go, are you crazy? You know, how are we going to do this? You know, because, you know, it's just, coaches don't make very much and so i kept thinking to myself you know god will provide god will provide Amen. Amen. i just have to be loyal to the call and at that time i was also doing adoration hours uh i, I think i had the midnight the 1 a.m shift or something <laughs> like that so i was every time i was in there i was pleading just please please tell me if i'm crazy let me you know i need some help here i really yeah. need some help because I feel so this is what I'm supposed to be doing, mm. and yet I don't know how to get there and what to do, and I don't want to sacrifice the well-being of my family and those kinds of things. And so anyway, and then all of a sudden, Pfizer laid me off. Wow. And so Chris Ann said, hey, if we can stay in the same house and kids can stay in the same school, you know, go do what you oh want to do. Gosh. And so I, I got the Nebraska Wesleyan job. Wow. And I was commuting. I had both the men's and women's team, so the Division Three programs. So I had both the men and women. And uh, I was coaching them up, and we practiced at 6 and 8 in the evening. So I usually get to work. And, in fact, also during this time, I think you're familiar with John Keating, our men's coach here at Belmont yep. Abbey. He and I were coaching together in Omaha at the time. And he was, as I came off Pfizer, and I had this, you know, time before I got on the Nebraska Wesleyan. And, and then once I started that, he goes, it's a great opportunity to get the daily mass. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was like, you know, it is a great opportunity for daily mass. And I had always had friends who just swore by daily mass. And I never had really taken that up as a way of life. And that's when I started to go to daily mass. And I didn't make it every day, but I made it a lot. And I always found it as just a boost in my day. It kind of gave me a spring in my step. And so I would go to daily mass, take care of some things, drive to Nebraska Wesleyan, spend the day, practice at six, practice at eight, drive home. And it was my drive home that uh, I heard about Belmont Abbey. Mm. I was listening to the local Catholic radio station and Dr. Fearfelder, our president, was on talking about what he was trying to do at Belmont Abbey. I, I'm listening to this and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is exactly how I wow. feel. This wow. is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And so I shot off a note to him and said, hey, I happened to catch your broadcast. If you ever need a soccer coach, let me know. Mm. And he got back to me and said, you know, I'm a big believer in Providence. I think our paths will cross, uh, you know, someday, probably sooner than you think. Oh, my gosh. And it was a year later that uh, I was uh, hired at Belmont Abbey. Oh, wow. Wow, that is powerful. That is powerful. And folks, yes, you did hear Mike mention the name of John Keating way, way, way back as the first year of Catholic Sports Radio wrapped up, episode 51. You can go all the way back to January of 2020 to listen to that interview. I mentioned this in the intro, Mike. Tell us more about United Soccer Coaches Faith-Based Coaches Community 
as well as Missionary Athletes International. So United Soccer Coaches has what the, they initially called them advocacy groups, and then now they call them their communities, coaching communities. And what they are is just an opportunity for either who you coach or who you like to identify with. And so, you know, they have high school coaches, you have college coaches, you have youth coaches, and that's kind of who you coach, or you have people that you identify with. And so there's, you know, the Black Coaches Association, there's the Women Coaches Group, there's uh, the Native American Coaches Group, we had the Faith-Based Coaches Group, we had the LGBT Coaches Group. And so, you know, these are just then people who would be able to get together with other coaches that share a lot of their same beliefs and philosophies and be able to share ideas. And so we were able to start the faith-based coaches community in 2017, and I was the first chair of that group. And it was really, really rewarding. So not only did we be able to insert some programming into the annual convention, but we would also get on conference calls. You know, we call them iron chats, you know, or iron sharpens iron. Mm. And so we would have, a, you know, these would be monthly sessions where we would bring on a group of coaches to talk about a certain topic. And so we had iron chats, we have our Bible study, but it was just really, really nice. And Missionary Athletes International was one of the groups that would always be at the convention. They have a very strong presence here in Charlotte, which is Belmont Abbey is just, uh, you know, five, 10 minutes from Charlotte, as well as around the country. Missionary Athletes International has teams in Chicago and LA, um, I believe now in Nashville, but they have been in the sports ministry business for probably you know 30 years 30 mm. 40 years there may be some that are better but i don't know i mean they are really really good <laughs> at what they do and you know they have not only uh you know professional teams in some of the places they'll have youth clubs and interestingly when u.s soccer which is our national governing body when they were doing a thing called the Development Academy, DA. So this was the highest level you could play as a youth player. This was a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Players were turning down DA spots so that they could play for the Charlotte Eagles because the parents were looking for something different. You know, how do we find elite level competition where soccer is not our God? And mm. that's not where we identify ourselves. Wow. They all of a sudden found that, guess what? You can play at the highest level and still put your faith first. Mm. And Missionary Athletes International, they go down and do mission trips, Central America, South America, Africa, Asia, all the time. I mean, they've got a group going all the time. I still have yet to be able to join them on one of their trips. I really want to do that because I want to see what they're doing. It's one yeah. of my things on my to-do list is, <laughs> can we create a, uh, a sports ministry piece of our program here at Belmont Abbey, if not all of Abbey Athletics. But I really want to, like right now, we have a tradition of taking our team to the World Cup. And then as part of that, we're taking tours of the local culture, which always mm. includes, you know, beautiful, beautiful Catholic cathedrals nice. and different things. You know, we've been to Italy, we've been to France. Mm. Uh, we went to New Zealand and Australia for the World Cup last summer. Wow. But I would love to also include trips in there where we're doing ministry. We're yeah. we're either you know part of a project or we're just we're using our sport to be able to connect with the local population yeah. and yeah. share the gospel and all kinds uh, of things. Just so. tremendous, just tremendous. And folks, I mentioned one prior interview. I'll give you another one to go back and listen to. You heard Mike mention Dr. Bill Tierfelder, the president of Belmont Abbey, and he was on the show too, also in early 2020. That was way back on episode 56, February 24th of 2020, to be exact. Mike, I would be remiss. You just started to mention it if I did not ask you about Belmont Abbey Women's Soccer. Congratulations. The program has earned multiple sportsmanship awards over the years. That being a Catholic college, what are you doing in the program that is a direct effort to mix faith with the sport? We have a lot of metrics in our program, um, and one of those is this Ethics and Sportsmanship Award that's available to every college team at the beginning of every season. It's basically an award to lose almost you know, because you have to be able to play your competitions in a sporting and ethical way. And they use yellow and red cards. Now, is that the best way to measure that? No, but it is a way. <laughs> and we just use it as one of the barometers to see how we're doing. And so you basically have to go through an entire season without any red cards, wow. players or staff. 
Wow. And then as far as the yellow card caution, you know, which would be for unsporting behavior, violent behavior, that kind of stuff, those you have to keep to less than 50% of your games. And you would think that that's not a high bar, but it actually is. You know, in the men's game, it's virtually unachievable. Mm. You know, that they're so athletic, they're so physical, there's, you know, collisions constantly, so there's a lot of cards going. But even so, even in the women's games, especially for the competitive teams, you know, because they're just really getting after it. We don't aspire to be a team that gets recognized for sportsmanship, but not competitiveness. We mm-hmm. want to be recognized for our competitiveness and our sportsmanship. Sure. And so one of the things that we used to talk about in our faith-based coaches with United Soccer Coaches is you don't have to have a strong faith in order to be sporting, but it would be odd to say that you are faith-centered and not be sporting. Mm. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if somebody were to come up and watch our team train or watch our team play, would they see a great sporting example? Mm-hmm. Therefore, we have no dissent. We don't tolerate dissent. We don't uh, tactical foul, you know, which means we're a gross bending of the rules in order to get a competitive advantage. Mm-hmm. We won't tactical foul. It takes away the beauty of the game. We're not going to try to get the ball when it's not ours. We're not going to retaliate. And our players, they just know that's just who we are. That's how we play. Mm. And so as a result, we've been able to get that ethics and sportsmanship award now for 12 straight years. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because we, um, one year we had a, I don't know if you're familiar with the nuances of soccer rules, but if you have a last defender foul, that can be a red card. So we had a last defender foul by our goalkeeper back in 2013, maybe. And so that bumped us out. But otherwise, we've been able to (laughs) achieve that mark And so it's something that it's just one indicator. Certainly, again, I really appreciate how our girls play. They know that when I'm cutting the film, I can see a tackle that we put on an opponent, and I can see whether your intent was to Uh, compete or whether your intent was to get them back. Wow. And I can see it in your body language, and they know that I will call them out on it. And uh, if I don't see it live during the game, I'll see it on the film. I want to go back to the acronym that I referred to during the break, that you have, which is W-I-N, as well as that photo that I mentioned that shows a Bible verse across the locker room. So explain to the audience what those two elements are. Yeah, so W-I-N, what's important now, has been part of my coaching philosophy, I think, since the very beginning. And, you know, in order to be successful, you need to be in the present moment. And so what's important right now? And so if you focus on winning the result usually performance goes down. If you focus on the present moment, on being a great teammate, on, you know, don't be thinking ahead or don't be thinking of your past mistake or a future mistake, you know, that means you're not in the present moment. Just play in the game. Just make the play that's right there before you. That's where peak performance exists. And so, you know, it's in tape on our wall, what's important now, W-I-N, all the players, it's a tradition in our program, hit the win on the way out. Mm. And so they hit it. And uh, it's part of their, you know, superstition on the way out to the field. <laughs> and then you mentioned uh, the scripture verse, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. So you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We have that on one side of the board. And of course, you know, what's before that is, you know, you love your, love your God with all your heart, your body, and your soul. And it's the first and greatest commandment. The second one being you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's really, really central to our program. What I didn't send with you is a picture on the other side of the wall, similar wall, is YNWA. You never walk alone. And so I I stole that from Liverpool. You know, there's a a whole song that goes along with it. But our program, our kids, they really have latched on to that. You'll never walk alone. Mm. To love your neighbors yourself, you know, be a great teammate. The scripture verse is kind of a core piece of our program, core part of our culture. And the girls, they embrace it. And, you know, we have obviously girls on our team who have very strong faith. We have girls on our team that uh, has a a small but growing faith. You know, some that uh, maybe didn't grow up in a formal organized religion, didn't have any Mm. access to that. And so hopefully it's growing. And it's there to just be a constant reminder. This is who we are. How we play matters. I'm going to evaluate how we play as well as, as, uh, you know, things we're able to accomplish to do in the game. I love it. And that You'll Never Walk Alone, I believe that's the song that Jerry Lewis used to sing at the end of the Muscular Dystrophy Telethon every year, if, if I'm correct on that. Mike, let's close by having you first share with the audience 
what you've been doing with one of your brothers over the past three years, but then also because you've mentioned them several times, how long you and your wife have been in the sacrament of holy matrimony and then the family that the two of you have made? Tim, my oldest brother, he and I have always, you know, been competitive and stuff and that we're always very outdoorsy and active. And so we got this idea of the Appalachian Trail and we said, hey, we don't have the time and I don't or the maybe the ability to be able to be a through hiker and go all the way from, you know, from Springer Mountain, Georgia, all the way up to Mount Katahdin in Maine. But we would like to be section hikers and not even section hikers because a full section hikers, because that means you do every state just, you know, all the, the mileage. And I think it's 1400 miles or something like that. So we just, we don't have that time, but we can do a mini section. So what we've been doing is we said, okay, every year let's figure out a time and then we're going to do 20 miles in North Carolina. Then we're going to do 20 miles in West Virginia. So we're doing these states. Right now we're nine down. We've got five to go. We've been doing them since 2021. I'll tell you that uh, the time in New Hampshire on the presidential range, Mount Washington, where it's the windiest and coldest in the country, was the windiest and coldest I've ever been. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was in, in the summertime. And uh, in fact, Chris Ann, my wife, uh, joined, uh, and my brother's wife, Deb, joined us. Mm. And he, he looked back on it, and we lived through it. It's funny, because when you get to the top of Mount Washington, there's a lodge up there, and they've got the list of all the people who died hiking up there. And so you're like going, oh boy, now I understand what we're in. But uh, <laughs> it's super fun. I love being out in nature. I love being where you got to rely on everything that you're carrying to either, you know, feed you or keep you dry or to, you know, sleep in, that kind of stuff. And so we've been doing that and uh, we've got five more states to go. So hopefully we'll be able to get that uh, completed. Very cool. I mentioned my wife, Christiane, again, just such a great blessing to me and to our family, to my kids, a great mom. She and I were married in 1992. In fact, we were married at the Air Force Academy. Hmm. So Christiane and I have been married 32 years. And uh, we got great kids, and they're all doing well. We're empty nesters now, and just it's been a, a joy to watch our kids uh, grow and be the people that they were meant to be. Fantastic, fantastic, Mike! Amazing testimony. Thank you so much for everything that you shared with us. I appreciate you making time to be on Catholic Sports Radio. God bless you and your family. Thank you for the opportunity, Bruce. Uh, appreciate it. My pleasure, my pleasure. And folks, it's only fitting that we close this week's episode with a prayer for coaches. So let's do it together, of course, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From Joshua 24, As for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. Lord, I desire to serve you. Help me to make the right choices and encourage my players to do the same. Give me strength to act with integrity, even when others choose not to. Allow me to stand firm in my decisions and rest in the peace and love that only you can provide. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. This is Catholic Sports Radio. Find more at catholicsportsradio.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It is at Cath Sports Radio on all those, C-A-T-H, at Cath Sports Radio. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's that it's Jesus that you always choose.